Hello there, everyone, and thank you for joining me here at the start of a new campaign in Tio No, The Last of Europe, one of my favorite mods of all time for Hearts of Iron 4. I'm your host, Mr. Mocha Lover, and we're playing as the United Kingdom, in which we're trying out, at the time of the recording, the new The Ruin update for the UK. And really the mod itself, but we're now led by a guy named Barry Domville. I might read about him in a little bit, or maybe later when there's not much else to read, but this is Tio No, The Domville Cabinet. In the name of His Majesty King Edward VIII, I hereby appoint the following members as members of the cabinet and the government and in his name. Home Secretary Andrew Fontaine. So we have a bunch of different names here, so if you're wondering about who we have here, please go right ahead. Um, but signed, Barry Domville. Uh, we have a ghost of 1956. Six years, six years since the uprising of 1956 wrought disaster and anarchy upon nearly every part of this nation as the Chesterton Ministry was paralyzed under its weight. Fortunately, chaos was met by the combined forces of order, and with a joint pushback from both our army and the German brother garrison, the uprising was crushed utterly. Since then, an uneasy calm returned to the nation, and the Domville Ministry's enlightened rules caused prosperity to return to Britain. Yeah, the, BPP membership to increase and the extreme ideological splits between uh, some uh, some of us and some none of us in our party to become workable. However, all reports from MI5 indicate the same thing. Himmler activity is increasing again, and that um, T guys are beginning to reemerge in areas where they have not been active since the uprising. We must not make the same mistake Chesterton did, and thus we must begin to take preemptive measures. The workshop of the world will now be available on your political menu. Cool. And approach the Hydra. Our party, the BPP, is by all respects not what it was once was. Where once there was unity and strength, factionalism and corruption has taken hold. It is entirely intolerable in a time where we will have to pass new measures to deal with the terrorists, the old guard, devout supporters of Prime Minister Barry Domville. Which I might be saying wrong. Domville? Domville? Still embody the spirit of Britain and can be fully relied on both for loyalty and competence, but they unfortunately no longer hold a majority in the party. The pragmatists, led by weak advocates of a demagogic rule, led by Rab Butler, will find a way to object to our measure under the grounds of tyranny and the ideologies, or ideologues. Ex communists and a. <clears throat> Fascist cloak who stand for much of the same mob rule that the pragmatists advocate for will oppose these measures for no better reason than the old guard supports them. Must find a remedy to this constant factionalism and create a totally united party, or else infighting will consume us before Himmler even gets a chance to. A haunted prime minister. Heavy rain was hammering loud on the windows of Downing Street when the booming gongs of Big Ten rang out across London 12 times, signaling the end of another uh, day. And that it was finally time for Prime Minister Barry Domville to go to bed. Running this hose old with somewhat shaky hands over his face, Domville or Domville. Let a pain side to look down on the report before him. A report which had mockingly devoured the past four hours of his life and all but ensure that he'd be getting no sleep tonight. This had to be the third time he'd read it from start to finish, but the sheer trepidation and dread that he had felt when first turning the pages never left and only intensified. Eh, Majesty's most low resistance, that name along alone was enough to descend a disgusted shiver down the Prime Minister's spine. He remembered when he first heard it. In this very room, no less, as he was meeting his old friend and then Prime Minister, A.K. Chesterton, in 1954. I remember how they both laughed at the ridiculousness of it all, the very notion that some wide-eyed idealists and bitter remnants of the past could possibly pose a threat to the resurgent Britain and her watchful German allies. He remembered how the reports continued in the years that followed, telling of recent meetings and covert raids, warning of a ticking time bomb ready to explode at any moment. And Don Bell remembered when it did explode and the world came crashing down. Now the very same report he had once laughed at sat in front of him again. Setting the report aside, Don Bell reached for his telephone and dialed the German embassy. He did not make Chesterton's mistake and paid the price he did. Oh no. Now is the time for action. Demand the guns and prepare for battle. The Admiral had won the last war to fight and intended to win. So, Britannia sails to war, of course, like normal. Ooh, what do I have over here? Workshop of the world. Oh god. Oh god, what is this? Leading Blum and Voss. State. Corporate. Private. What the heck is this? Ownership. Corporations. Deutsche Bank. Reichswerke. Carte Blanche sell offs. He lose stuff. Increase influence. State ownership changes. Contract permits. Corporate ownership in the state increases by 1.5. 1. Regulatory enforcement. Oh my god. What is this even about? I don't think I read the patch notes. I think I need to go back and read the patch notes. Debt moratorium. We tend to political power right now. More influence. Emergency takeovers. GDP growth is 3.4%. Inflation. Oh God, Rex Becca owns the most. AEG, huh? Economic statistics. Yeah, the growth is pretty stagnant. Wow. Well, you know, it could be worse. Growth target is 4.4%, but still. 
Oh, it's not southeast. Oh god. Ownership mode. Corporate. Wow, this is really cool. I'll be honest, I've not even seen this before. Volkswagen. Private enterprise down here. Well, at least that's good. Um, nationally, though. Down Corporation Reichswerke. Thames Estuary Airport. Oh, there are 899 days to do this. Before the time runs out, all objectives here have to be fulfilled. A completion has to be equal to 100% for the project to be successful. Completion. Uh, Deutsche Bank influence is... Ab and London is above 33. Corporate ownership is above 33. Um, so what happens if we don't? We got 7 barrage. We can increase the amount of influence we have here, or the amount of production units, AEG, state ownership. I kind of want state ownership. I don't want them to... Well, then again, the route we're going to go for this campaign is going to be a little different than normal. Um, does that cost me anything? I don't know. This is new. I'm getting confused. Uh, end of the Missile Crisis, which is good, but let's read about him now. Throughout the long and storied history of the British Isles, it has frequently been sung by millions across the globe that Britannia ruled the waves. And yet it was not until she conquered that a sailor was selected to rule over her. But Sir Barry Edward Domville is no great hero of the waves, nor conqueror of fair lands like his ancestors were. No, in fact, he is perhaps the most hated man on the British Isles, a traitor of the highest order and the captain at the helm of nothing more than a shackled kingdom. Born in 1878 to Admiral Sir Compton and Domville, he followed his father's footsteps and joined the Navy in 1892, commanding ships during the First World War and being further promoted afterwards to serve in a variety of different offices, including Director of Naval Intelligence. But his true purpose came with his infatuation with the far right, which would begin after his visit to Germany in 1935, wherein, after being impressed by the Nazi government, he was invited to the Nuremberg rallies as a guest of jo Joachim von Ribbentrop. Joining numerous Anglo-German organizations soon after, at the outbreak of the war, Don Bell spoke of the need for a bloody revolution leading to his internment in 1940. Yet the revolution would come with foreign arms, as Wehrmacht soldiers stormed the British beaches. While being overlooked by the Lloyd George government, it would be placed in key governmental positions in the subsequent ministries, becoming something of a titan of the British People's Party establishment. Following Chesterton's failures and the upswing in resistance activity, Donville's good standing with almost all factions of government and perceived competence made him the natural selection for a prime minister. Now, after six years of steering the ship through dangerous waters, the consensus seems that he has done a better job than most could, than he, most could do in his position. The economy seems to be steadily recovering, the nation seems to be growing more and more unified by the day, and the ghosts of the past grow ever dimmer. As for resistance, Don Bell's methods seem to have worked, after all, after activity has dramatically declined since the 1950s. Perhaps it's the beginning of a new age, or perhaps it's just the calm before the storm. And fighting shadows. It is all well and good to say that we're planning to fight Himmler, but in truth, we really do not know who it is we are fighting. The only Himmler commanders we know I the identities are of the left resistance leader, Jack Jones, and SOE leader, Fitzroy McLean. The lower-ranking commanders and the leader of Himmler itself remains unknown to MI5. We have also have virtually no knowledge of how many terrorists there are. Nor do we know what weapons they have access to or how they plan to use them. Fighting a borderline indivisible foe will be extremely difficult, and we must get MI5 to ramp up their investigations in Himmler if we truly wish to defeat them. MI5 is the oldest, yet most loyal, most effective houses that yet stand. Evening chats. Uh, production units, of course. And we, so we really have. We really have plus already. It's great. Night and day. There, Don Bell had long since grown used to the headache that seemed to appear in his head whenever Rab Butler and Andrew Fontaine were in the same room together. Sometimes it appeared as a heavy thump, but other times it would be high pitched whirling. Whatever it was, it seemed that his body developed an instinctual intolerance for the senseless, endless bickering that filled the room whenever the two men were forced to interact. Prime Minister, you simply cannot abide by some of the measures here. It is upsetting. A gross violation of the British people's privacy and personal safety, Butler said, forcing Don Bell to get back to his own back in. Of course, he took issue with the Freedom of Security Act. He wouldn't ever turn down a chance to illustrate how much more dissent and, or decent and reasonable he was from everyone else. I mean, some of the methods are grotesque. I mean, increased usage of the FBC, greater surveillance in public, a year's prison for curfew breakers, insanity. A humorless uh, chuckle from across the room signaled that it was time for the Fontaine to speak. As if Donville hadn't heard enough, a pseudo-Bolshevik felt that day already. Oh, this is this act is an insanity bill, right? How can you call it a Freedom of Security Act when you barely increase the funding for the security agencies? And how are they meant to get anything done without authorizing use of extraordinary force to interrogate suspects? They're practically begging for another uprising. Oh, you would love another uprising, wouldn't you, Butler Spat? Another chance of gratuitously brutalize your fellow countrymen is practically a gift to your lot. Fontaine twitched irritably. Why, are you impugning on my character, Butler? I do believe that that would come under Section 7, Paragraph 6 of the Penal Code. Not a good look at all. Is that you gish galloping moralizing twit? Can both of you be quiet for two seconds so I can think if you me, please? Dumbbell snapped, slamming his desk for emphasis. 
Butler and Fallon Tane both stopped looking at Dawnville. I'll consider some revision to the bill, as you both have so helpfully suggested, he said. Feeling that all too familiar thumping in his head, in the meantime, I'm going to ask both of you to get out of my office so I can think this over, if you please. And the two naughty schoolboys, like two naughty schoolboys, they bowed their heads and left. The 1962 Budget Statement. The theme of this year's budget is sound expansion. Expansion of the British economy's strengths without expansion of the British economy's flaws. In the spirit, it is the government's goal to achieve 3% real annual growth by the end of 1962. The clock ticked to six. Rob Butler bolted away his reports. A lit cigarette burned out in the ashtray. He had triple-checked the numbers every day for the past week and found them sound sensible. Practical economic policies were neatly arranged in his head and on the budget he was about to hand to the parliament. He no doubt he could not afford them. However, as we pursue a growing economy, we cannot allow inflation to destroy all of our efforts. It is also, therefore, that the government's goal is to restrain inflation to under 3%. The clock ticked to 7.30. Butler exited his car, thanked his driver, and lugged his heavy attaché case from across a Cromwell Green. He saw a gaggle of journalists around the podium, at the top which was Andrew Fontaine. Butler stopped to watch a commotion. Fontaine spoke of prosperity, cooperation, greater rewards for the British worker. Fontaine spoke of promises that were not his to fulfill. Butler turned his head and walked away. Above all, it is the government's chief aim to provide prosperity and employment for all Britons. Therefore, it is also the government's goal to create 500,000 new, 500, new jobs by the end of the year. The clock ticked at 8.30. In the halls of Westminster, a few corridors away from the House of Commons, Butler assures an increasingly nervous Dombal. Prime Minister, we've had our finest civil servants on the job. Yes, we checked the numbers. Yes, I checked the numbers. Uh, Butler felt the pressure which lay on top of Dombal, pressure from above, pressure that was Butler's to alleviate. The time has come to fulfill all of our promises. I want more growth. 1.6 is decent. I'll take that. Finding Shadows. Uh, the Lord's Approval. After our German brothers liberated Britain from demagoguery and finance in the World War, one of our first actions was the repeal of the 1911 Parliament Act, which returned to the House of the Lords their ancient right, a veto over any and all legislation passed by the Commons. This means that the Freedom of the Security Act will require the approval of the Lords in order to pass. Fortunately, the House of Lords is by far the most reasonable and loyal body of the government in the United Kingdom. The old guards are still dominant there, and the pragmatists and ideologues alike are pushed to the fringes. As such, it is highly unlikely that they'll have any issue with the Act, however. Uh, in order to make certain of this, the Prime Minister will meet with his old friend, Lord Portsmouth, a uh, devout supporter of the government, and the de facto leader of the old guard in the House of Lords, with his back in the act will certainly pass through the Lords. Evening chats. Chats. I'm going to be quite honest. I think he's a load of bollocks. He's too con incon it's too convenient of a scapegoat for them to blame everything on. Hannah and her friends often met on nights like this. They would all wait until they finished their respective jobs before creeping out of the houses and meeting up for smoking a quick natter. More often than not, the discussions turned to various political questions that dominated the nation. On this evening, discussion had turned to the identity of the ever-elusive man behind the resistance, the boss. The discussion tonight had started over a recent failed police raid of the docks, only minutes away from Hannah's house. The raid, according to the glorious husband, who worked at the docks, aimed to arrest the wing of the left resistance operating in the city. She would remember the outrage shouting of the woman as they had arrived. Yet as the jackboots rolled in, the operation went horrifically wrong. Details were scarce, and supposedly five policemen were dead and the left resistance members escaped without a single man dead or captured. And so... Just as said time and time again, the local government was left embarrassed and the people were left to wonder once again how the resistance, the thought dead after 56, was able to survive after 20 years of persecution. You know, things really do seem to be reaching a boiling point, Gloria said excitedly. I can't wait to see how things will end up. You know, we can't miss this like our fathers did. And I paused before applying. She knew Gloria's father had been a conservative before the war, as Gloria was now, and she was supposing, supporting men that she would see as radicals uh, in more peaceful times. She wondered silently, could this kind of unity hold out in peace as it has in time of trouble? Sometimes anonymity has its, its advantages. For need, as we after we have a sip of decaf coffee here. Chancellor of the Exchequer was hardly an enviable position, even in times of prosperity. Yet Richard Austin Rab Butler was neither foolish nor unpopular if he did say so himself. Saddled with a state scar by war, wherein corruption was commonplace, he kept the economy steady and helped rebel Britain from the destitution of 1940s. Yet, despite all of his achievements, every so often Butler couldn't help but look back with funds to the 30s when he worked for an independent free Britain. Even a young minister then, yet they were perhaps the only times in his career that he felt free without regret. But then came Hitler and it had all come crashing down. Butler did not consider himself a coward, nor any of his contemporaries in the foreign office in the 30s. Well, men like Churchill baited for war. Men like Chamberlain fought for peace. Butler had not fought in the Great War, but he had seen the effect of it had on the British people. The entire towns had been decimated, their male population wiped out in a single afternoon. For that reason, he had sided with Chamberlain and fought to keep the boys safe this time, but it was all for now. War came and the graves of England were filled once again. Chamberlain and all others were gone now, too, either dead or having fled across the Atlantic, more than likely, cursing him as a coward and a traitor nightly. He was alone, surrounded by sycophants, fascists, and fools, left to somehow rebel or broken owl. More than once, he considered getting on a ship and leaving this godforsaken island to leave the fascists to collapse under the weight of their own incompetence, but it was a, it was a fool's dream. He made his bed now, built upon the corpses of the innocent. All he could do now was to make this new Britain as free and prosperous as the Germans would allow. Nowadays, there seems no reason to cry. I hope that I don't need to keep that political power, because uh, 
as you can see, we've already spent it all. <laughs> Inflation is not great. Um, but we're fresh off the presses still, and we'll get that 1% growth eventually. Working as intended. Of course, I'll make sure you have the boats you need. Donville felt the crushing weight of his world lifted off his shoulders for a brief moment as Gerald Wallop, or Gerard Wallop, Fifth Earl of Portsmouth and the BPP's leader of the House of Lords spoke, dispelling the cloud of worry and doubt that plagued the Prime Minister since morning. Good, good, that's excellent. Thank you, Jared. Uh, this act will be the care to ensuring our safety, I'm sure of it, said Don Bell's old friend nodding in agreement from the other side of the table. I quite agree, these vagabonds need a darn good thrashing from our boys. One final proper kick to put them down for good, replied at Wallop, stamping his cane on the ground for emphasis. And a damn good thrashing that shall get, don't you worry. Don Bell stretched as he spoke. Standing up and making his way over to the drinks cabinet to pour himself a glass of port. Whilst Wallop's news was good, there was still the concerning fact he'd even needed to hold this meeting at all. Donville remembered back in Bedford's day when the lords would largely obey without question the great mass of abstentions that always met their bills made redundant by the lack of a real opposition, but things had changed since then and not for the better. The pragmatists were getting bolder, seeing that every bell saw a cluster of abstentions turned into votes against, leading to meetings like this becoming a necessity. Something the matter, Prime Minister Wallop asked, as Donville turned to face him. No, 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 nothing was a matter, he thought. Shaking his head and tipping back to the port with a slightly wobbling hand, all was, all was well. The votes were assured. The problem of the loyalty of the lords could be handled some, some other time. The problems of yesterday consigned to tomorrow. Check in with Germania. Oh, maybe I should have done these ones first. Whatever. Check in with Germania. While we do not always agree on everything with the German brothers, they still did liberate Britain and were the unquestioned saviors and masters of Europe over the years. The garrison has become just another active part of the government, as any other, and the plenipotentiary uh, Vesin Maya has been instrumental in our affairs. For these reasons, we'll functionally need German approval if we wish to push back against Himmler, especially since we'll require the garrison to assist us with it. Therefore, we'll meet with the Wiesen, Wiesenmeier, Wiesenmeier and Wolf both, and inform them of our new anti-partisan policies and request approval and assistance. It isn't as though they will have any real objections to fighting the terrorists, right? Peter III, the chief, Malsir. Walk into 10 Downing Street, and you'll hear the shuffling of feet on the carpet, the vigorous shuffling of papers, the rhythmic clacking of typewriters, keys. Clock in every room, tick as civil servants focus their attention on their work. The radios are tuned primarily to the home of service for the bureaucrats. Oh, uh, edification, save for the one tuned to the third network in the break room. Or tea is poured, biscuits are retrieved, and bureaucrats gather around for lunch. The garden is a popular place for quiet reflections in which private secretaries take a break or a long lunch. Seated on its benches and admire the delicate garden work. Special advisors meet in its drawing rooms and discuss the business of the day. Oh my god. Uh, the conversations are sometimes sober and sometimes productive. What you will see also is a cat. Peter III, a black cat which skulks, skulked these halls, held an esteemed title, Chief Malsir, to the uh, cabinet office. Though a relatively recent tradition, the office of Chief Malsir has brought much joy to the bureaucrats and civil servants who work in the hallowed office. Its formal responsibility is the protection of 10 Downing Street against rodents and other pests. Informally, however, it exists so that the harried and overworked staff at 10 Downing Street have a cuddly little creature to comfort them, but it's been impossible to ignore how old Peter III has become. He served dutifully in this post since 1947, when he was just a kitten, and in 1962 his efforts have noticeably slowed. He labors to jump on the de on the desks that a younger Peter would have exerted little effort towards. He sleeps longer in the in trays of staff and must be pried off the morning copy of the Times. He eats less liver than his once prodigious appetite for liver might allow. Nevertheless, Peter the Third remains a solid companion for Downing Street's civil servants until that his last days, which will bring comfort and joy into their lives. There's still little joy in town and Downing Street, but Peter the Third does his best and for right. Of all the myriad social events and activities, Ger Gerard, 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 Gerard. Am I saying Gerard? Gerard Wallop, 9th Earl of Portsmouth, frequently attended. Uh, the King's evening reception at Buckingham's Palace was by far the most important and the most enjoyable, surrounded by the righteous men of the peerage, esteemed knights and dames, and of course His Majesty himself, it truly was perfection. Nothing like this weeping ruin that was Parliament these days, stuffed with money-hungry German stooges, thuggish louts, and lying socialists. It had fallen so very far from the national days of glory when he stood by Bedford's side as the BPP was swept to power. Now only a handful remained true to his vision that they set out with in 1945, and their numbers dwindled by the day. Plucking a glass of champagne from a roving waiter, <clears throat> uh, Wallop deftly navigated through the backroom ballroom, exchanging smiles and quick conversations with old friends while pretending not to notice his enemies, especially the ever-arrogant Germans that then that infernal Vesenmaya. Why the king even invited them in the first place was beyond him. Soon one of the Bedford's ministers, awarded a barony for his service, approached Lord Portsmouth. Wallop's initial enjoyment of their discourse started a sow, however, as it became uh, uh, oh, oh, crap, uh, clear. Quickly became clear. The ex-minister was approaching him, not as an independent player in the games of British politics, but merely as a leading representative of the old guard. One excuse later, and Wallop was free of the man, sighing in relief. While he was a firm supporter of Don Bills and agreed with the old guard in many places, he despised that his own ideas and ambitions were being crushed under the monolithic weight of the British fascism. 
Quite how he could escape from under, however, remained unanswered, to say nothing of reaching Downing Street in the first place. At that moment, however, His Majesty King Edward VIII entered the ballroom, and all gloomy thoughts of politics vanished in an instant. England is but the king's men, and the king's land, and the king's coin. Defining an enemy. What exactly is Himmler? It's a question that MI5 has been puzzling over for the past few years, and one that seemingly no closer is being to answered. While the official line from a government is that they are bloodthirsty Bolsheviks tied to the trade unions, and in many cases it appears to be true, that is clearly not the full story. Many Himmler fighters are clearly members of the old government, uh, with ties with exiles, fighting against their king for the pretender Elizabeth, which would suggest that they are not all communists in allegiance. Another far more worrying theory has gained traction in our government, although not an MI5, who fully disagrees with it. Many believe that Himmler is in fact a tool in the hands of high-ranking members of the government, who seek to use it to increase their personal power, a dagger which they can plunge into our backs at any time, and for strength. Whenever Andrew Fountaine stood to speak in front of the House of Commons, everyone had something to say. Whether it was a roar of disdain for or a cry of adoration, the man's presence was simply too encompassing to ignore. He knew and encouraged us, of course. It was an ideologue in the purest sense of the word, and such intense emotion was what needed to succeed. Today he was here to deliver a speech condemning the resistance and encourage the party to come together, as if. The old guard were practically irrelevant, and the pragmatists would do everything they could to weaken the nation from within. As he stood to support and cheered, soaking in the adulation for a moment. Fountaine cleared his throat. Mr. Speaker, with the recent lull in resistance activity, it would be perhaps, perhaps be easy to rest upon our laurels to allow the fire within ourselves to die down, so to speak. This cannot be allowed to happen. I would remind that this house that our enemies are many and they suffuse every aspect of our society. If we wish for the fascist revolution to survive and continue, then we must act. A series of jeers and hollers came for the pragmatists. Good. He continued. Now, while the enemy without is very nearly stamped out for good, I would advise all the good and true members of this house to keep constant vigilance for the enemy within, for they are among the most insidious of our foes. Where jeers from the pragmatists were drowned up by his own supporters, of course. Neither side knew that the resistance was nowhere near entirely scattered yet, but they did not need to. As long as they took his words so hard and did not question them, he was satisfied, of course. Britain was on the precipice of a new age, and Andrew Fountaine would be at his head. Is this a blackshirt rally or a governmental building? Nothing bad will happen, I assure you. The Prime Minister and the Foreign Secretary gracefully walked into the specific meeting room, or specified meeting room, with the Reich Plenipotentiary and the Commanding General. They started off cordial, not really getting on topic until ten minutes after Domville and Nal Kane entered the room. Nal Kane started hoping to update the Germans on the rebel situation. Well, thank you, but the Prime Minister and I came here to address both of you on the topic of the increased accounts of rebellious activities within Britain. I'll let him handle this. Domville cleared his throat. Gentlemen, let's make one thing clear. What is happening now will never, under my leadership, escalate to something seen under the leadership of Chesterton or any former government. There will be no widespread rebellion. What the people of Britain are experiencing now is just simply bandits and thugs bringing havoc across the nation, I assure you. This will not escalate. Both Germans nodded their heads. Thus, Vis and Maya seemed satisfied, granting Domville a handshake. Wolf, on the other hand, was hesitant. We seem exceptionally confident, and I would be willing to pledge the support of the garrison to your government. However, in return, we expect the Wehrmacht to be granted command of the garrison's officers. Domville's face fell, but he tried not to let it show. Another area of governess relinquished to Germania was nothing new, of course. This is not to imply British officers are incompetent, Wolf continued, a smug flicker in his eye. German soldiers require German leaders, after all. I trust this is acceptable, Domville said internally, knowing he had little choice. You have a deal. Hitler content has been released. Oh, the greatest lie ever told. Oh, his path is currently not available. Hitler update coming soon. Oh, I can't wait. The Freedom of Security Act. Yay. McLean's. Is it McLean's or McLean's? 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 I'm going to say McLean's. I'm probably wrong. This Marauders. Fitzroy and McLean and his merry men have been marauding around the countryside like mad dogs ever since we put down the former leader Sterling in 1956. Is Sterling dead then? Their hands are stained with British blood and they've been allowed to just roam the Scottish Highlands without any punishment? The hour of reckoning for these murders approaches. We managed to track them down to the Scottish Highlands where they've been hiding in the mountains for some time now. The whole area will be seized and placed under military control. We'll let our own mad dogs of BFC loose control loose inside the restricted zone and we'll handle these terrorists once and for all. The Brown Sinistral. Like all good national socialists, Edmund Wiesenmeyer felt a cold chill run down his spine the moment he heard that Hitler had been struck. Images of the worst case scenario appeared in his mind, the fatherland burning to ash. I was overrun by liberal Judeo Bolsheviks while he was trapped here powerless to help stop it, thankfully. The fear had survived, and such an event had not come to pass. Nodding at the two men who had brought him this news, he walked shakily back to his desk. Much of the much was on the mind of the plenipotentiary of the Reich to Britain. He had spent several years, seven years of his life on the island, seven long, unforgiving years that he had spent dealing with the whims and tantrums of these stupid people. The mighty German garrison had thrown everything it had alongside their puppets in Downing Street to squash the Jewish rats opposing the Reich, and Wiesenmeyer had been there all the way. It was a harsh and unforgiving job. He wished more than anything to be given the order to simply set Wolf and Wiggins upon anyone even remotely treacherous so that he could deliver Britain entirely into the Reich's hands. He frowned, though. 
The wreck itself was starting to buckle. He made it his business to keep up to date with what was happening in the fatherland, and the news here was almost always negative. Students running amok, the Fuhrer's evil advisors jockeying for power, the butchers under Hadrish growing ever stronger. If such things were to continue to happen, and God forbid for the Fuhrer were to die, then the Reich would be plunged into chaos. What would that even mean for Britain? Would the Jew prevail in the end? No, it couldn't be so. He shook his head, stealing himself. He would keep Britain very, very close to the Reich. Whether she wanted to be kept in a golden cage or dragged in chains, it mattered little to Vis and Maya. He had almost been doing this for a decade already. Maybe, may as well finish a job. Britain's gowler already is her lash. On Himmler, Barry Donville sat as he leant down in the chair at the head of the briefing room table. Opposite him, Maxwell Knight stood, suddenly staring down the table. With Donville seated, the remainder of the cabinet sat down almost at once, their faces carefully blank as they all settled. Visa and Maya stood down the table from beside Donville's carefully composed face, revealing nothing but a slight aura of distaste, and with that, night began. Gentlemen, he said, addressing the room, it is no secret to all of you that Her Majesty's most loyal resistance, or as they are commonly known, Himmler, is the largest known internal threat to our government. Following the Prime Minister's orders for me to expand our understanding of them and their weaknesses, Knight nodded towards Donville. I have handed this task to my most capable subordinate, Mr. Kim Philby, who will be briefing us all today. Mr. Philby? Mr. Philby stood to his feet. Thank you, sir. Now, I'll be honest, the resistance runs a tight ship. I've been able to find much that we do not already know. Nonetheless, I shall lay out the facts we have established. There are loose alliance between left resistance left by Jack Jones and the Special Operations Executive under Fitzroy McLean. There are two things uniting these incredibly diverse groups. The first is a figure we only know as the boss. The second is a desire for a free Britain. That is all we know about them on a broader scale. We have more information on the local scale, but nationally, that's it. What do you mean more on the local scale? Visa Maya asked, leaning forward in his chair, raising his eyebrow in interest. We are currently looking into some of their cells in Essex, but nothing is for certain at the moment. Phil B. Uh, replied. Visa Maya looked dissatisfied, shaking his head. I expect you to detain and execute these insurgents soon, and quickly, too. Jones's Jacobins. Du Bolshevism has always been one of Britain's chief enemies. And while we've historically remained thankfully free of that cancerous ideology, it does not mean that properties or proponents of such belief do not infest our nation. The left resistance and their leader Jack Jones are more uh, the more insidious side of the resistance. They hide in our factories, whispering their honeyed words into the ears of the honest workmen, turning them against us. This rot goes deep, and if we wish to stand any chance of beating the resistance wholesale, then we must rip their agitators and unsanctioned trade unions out by the root. Thankfully, the Gestapo have proven more than eager to aid us in this endeavor, and those should be sent to known hotspots of Bolshevist activity, we'll monitor the activity before raising it to the ground. The left resistance is a hideous agent of Judeo-Bolshevik subversion in England. Like rats, they must be driven out, hunting through the highlands. Roger smirked as the free corps platoons trudged their way through the heath. Uh, John had been leading them on a merry chase from Lock 11. Another plan was coming to fruition. Worming his way back to the scrub, Roger signaled to Will to radio off to a second squad for the north. A brief stackicky murmur filled the radio and all that was ready. Smirking at Will, Roger propped, popped his head above the heath and gave a sudden holler. The free corps men almost squawked in surprise, swinging their hand-me-down gavards around to face Roger as he ducked below uh, the heath again and began to sprint north. As the whole hail of rifle fire filled the air, Roger ducked up again for nearly half an hour. He lured the free corps men north to the old banks of the Heath serving as a perfect cover for his movement. All the while, Fort William drew, Road drew nearer. Suddenly, Roger sprinted out into a bare stretch of ground. The road was, was right ahead of him, and behind him, he could hear the free corps bundling to forwards. This was the most dangerous stretch of the plan. Roger threw his entire body into the sprint, running at full force towards the concealed foxhole as a sudden crack of rifle behind him forced Roger even more into the long run. Then he passed the safety line and hit the ground. The sudden screams of a trio of machine guns filled the air as the first and second squads opened fire. Roger could feel the power of the thuds. Guns thudding through the earth as he dug into the dirt. A lonely rifle shot was fired, and then all fell silent. Pushing himself up, Roger looked through behind him at the steaming corpses of the Free Corps men. Really effective crackdown, huh, Roger? John snarked as he strode over, steam rising from the Bren gun he cradled in his arms. Ah, oh, Dumbbell's just killing off the Free Corps, ain't he? Roger replies as he dusted himself off. Hey, it could just be cracked down on the Free Corps. The laugh from the two squads were suddenly cut off as the drone from a helicopter filled the air. By the time it got there, only the dead remained, and the Queen's PM. A vain man is not something many would describe Harold Macmillan as. The nigh Edwardian sensibility old man prevented such a thing, yet as he sat down in his office, listening to the words that he had spoken only hours earlier through the radio, he couldn't help but berate himself for such an indulgence. And now in these hours, darker than ever, uh, we can only keep steady and brace ourselves for what may be, hopefully the sunlight, shining through the clouds. Thank you. God save the Queen. The fuzzy sound of the applause followed, and that was Harold Macmillan, leader of the Conservative Party in exile, speaking at the annual Commonwealth Conference, supplied a rather nasally commentator. There's been a third such a speech that Mr. Macmillan has made on the topic of the British government in the last five months. Our sources have known. The presenter was quickly silenced as Macmillan switched off the radio. Did they truly see him as not but a desperate, aimless old man with nothing better to do than whittle on about the same old injustices ad nauseum? He sighed at that thought. 
Perhaps they were right. He was king of the exiles after all. There had been hope that at the start. He remembered the righteous, burning anger that each and every Englishman worth his salt felt at their beloved nation being invaded by the Nazi scum. He remembered. Uh, the fire in the eyes of every single one of his fellow MPs that sought to reclaim the birthright and to see the collaborator dogs flung in jail for the crimes and by God what he would give to give that to them. And yet as the years, years drew on, the fire dimmed. None of them grew any happier with the situation, but some of the monks simply felt that there was nothing more that could be done to save the country. There had been some hope for the change in the 50s when the fascist idiots inevitably tied themselves into one too many knots, but that was only temporary. When it appeared that the situation had begun to destabilize, the malaise of the exiles got even worse. Sometimes he even began to wonder, was it all worth it? McMillan shook his head, getting up from his chair and walking over to the cabinet. He kept in the corner of the room. He pulled out a large bottle of brandy and poured himself a small glass of it. By no means did he drink as much as Churchill did. He sipped it gently, letting the bitter uh, drink sting his tongue. He had to keep going, the conservatives had to keep going, they would all be going, keep going until the homeland was inevitably won back, where both he and his party would finally be able to redeem themselves for queen and country. The British Free Corps. From the moment the brutes of the Wehrmacht first began to tripe tripes across the British shores, it was known that they would need a class of collaborators who would help them in their efforts no matter what. That was also a group of men willing to do whatever it took to maintain the new order imposed by the Reich, and so it was. Under the watchful eye of the commanders of the SIPO and the SD in Great Britain, Wolfgang uh, Polzelt, uh, Polzelt, the British Free Corps was performed. Popular by some of the most fanatical and devoted collaborators, men who worshipped Hitler like a prophet, these men were to help the SS and the police work. It was from the BFC that some of the most horrific atrocities of the occupation came, and to this day most recoil and fear upon the side of their insignia. Despite assurances from the Germans to their loyalty and the usefulness of the government, the BFC and their leader, Thomas Haller Cooper, are often kept at arm's length. After all, how can one truly trust men more loyal to Hitler than their own people? So do I need all these together? Anglia. Inflation's kind of high, isn't it? Ooh, and unemployment's pretty high, too. Ah. More influence, huh? State ownership. Hmm. Who's the boss? There's something wrong in the UK. Under the myriad layers of resistance and leadership, there's lies of a supposed brain behind the bronze. A spider at the center of the web, a puppet master who hides in the shadows, quietly manipulating the ebb and flow of the movement. They've eluded detection for as long as we can remember, even the likes of Jones and McLean uh, kowtow before them. This individual is undoubtedly the head of the snake, as we know them as a boss. Despite our best efforts, we've been able to uncover literally nothing about the boss. He, or even possibly she, for that matter, is a nigh mythical figure within the resistance. Despite this, next to nobody's ever spoken to the man, and his identity is unknown to anyone, save for perhaps the terrible twins, whoever it is. They are doubtless a mastermind of the highest order to keep the resistance alive after all these years. This, well, of course, assuming that the boss is real. We cannot be too hasty in assuming that he is not simply a cover for the series of individuals, or simply a story. Nonetheless, MI5 shall launch an investigation to cover just who the boss is, if he is real at all, that is. Is there a man that lies beyond the veil of which we are yet to pierce? If such a man exists, then a discovery would make our efforts a guaranteed success. Driving the masses, a stuffy storeroom in a damp, ill-lit warehouse beside one of the Manchester's numerous Reichsvacker steel factories was hardly a pleasant location for a clandestine meeting, but it's a secure one, and for the senior members of the Manchester's underground industrial union, that was worth far more than comfort. So how's it looking, John? All your lads on shift A in? asked Stephen, the unofficial leader of the unionized drivers responsible for taking the produced steel to the docks before it was shipped off to feed the, and the sunger of the Reich's military. Aye, that they are, replied John, a floor manager for the main factory right opposite the warehouse. He's been slowly recruiting workers to the cause for years since taking up the mantle from his predecessor, dead in the uprising of 56. The room fell silent as the man at the head of the table moved to speak, and like the others, the unions, general secretary no position in the Reichsverkehr. He was, in fact, currently waiting for high treason, but instead worked solely for the union and the left resistance. Then we are to proceed when called. I'll tell Jones that Manchester stands ready for the revolution, he said, passing around the report he'd been reading with a smirk. The fascist bastards have led us a helping hand, it seems, he joked, as the paper was passed from hand to hand. Drawing a mixture of reactions, but all positive. Our recruitment rate has a soared since they called in the Gestapo buggers to try and root us out. Random interrogations and intimidation doesn't seem to be working too well for the crowds. Finding his way back to the general secretary before long, the meeting could soon concluded. As the attendees vanished back in the night. The following morning, most returned to the working and faking contentment under the arrogant, arrogant gaze of their German overseers, but one thought was that all, all in their minds. And I thought spreading around the minds of every worker chafing under the Nazi joke, or yoke. Soon this one would pay, the Freedom of Security Act. The Freedom of Security Act is the last piece of legislation needed to finally snuff out the resistance for good. While I have had a steady stream of support for the bill from the House of Commons, or <coughs> House of Lords, and our German benefactors for months, the House of Commons has finally come to support its senses, come to its senses, and decided to pledge support for the bill. As some take off the silk and gloves, we have been far too tolerant and careful in dealing with the rebels so scurrying across Britain. With the momentum of the resistance 
uh, appears to have been gaining as of late is frighteningly possible to suggest that another master bolt may soon be on its way. This possibility is one we must smother immediately. We cannot allow these thugs and hooligans to tear down everything the British People's Party has built for the nation. Not now, not ever. God save the king! Maxwell and the MI5 will be granted special powers to handle the internal resistance for us. The modern Cato. All across the Britain, on factory floors to old ramshackle houses, the people go quiet just for an hour as so many of them listen anxiously on the battered radios. But it is at this time every Tuesday at 19, uh, 1900 pronto, a broadcast goes out. It speaks of the tireless work of Britain standing up to fascism, of working past the failures of the old tired men, and of a new better Britain emerging from the ashes. One not tied down by its failings, but pushed forward by its people. That broadcast did come from Britain. It was not from an old resistance general, nor an old politician from the war, in fact. It was given by an asthmatic former journalist, the man who now stands as the head of the exiled Labour Party, Michael Foot. Foot? Foot. As he finishes his broadcast each week, he cannot help but feel a tinge of guilt for hiding away in Canada while the brave resistance members continue to fight. Foot had risen to lead the Labour Party, an exile mainly because very few wanted the role, so many of his exiles had given up after the failures of the 50s and had simply given up the hope for Free Britain. A long way to destroy so many exiles hopes for a better Britain, hoping the liberation of the old world, yet Foot, even in his darkest days when he heard Beaver Brook, his old mentor had died, never really gave up hope. How could he give up the faith when so many Britons continued to fight to die against tyranny of the BP P, and their Nazi puppet masters? His peers called him a fool, hopeless romantic, for continuing to dream of a free Britain, and, but he has faith. History has shown that tyranny does not prosper forever, all great dictators eventually fall to the will of the people. When the day comes, when Britain is finally liberated, it will finally be Foot's time to work for the people of Britain, and repay his everlasting debts to all those who have died and those who continue to fight to create a new Jerusalem from the ashes of fascism. Hope came in undulating waves, so a lot of surplus. Growth is okay. Uh, inflation is not going to be spiking as much as it did earlier, and we have even more growth, so. Even though GDP growing were not as much, but you know, whatever. And with 48% debt to GDP ratio. The roots of the problem. Don Bell sat in his office, stewing away in his own paranoia. Day after day, more reports came in from a new attack from the resistance, where those culprits struck an instant, struck in an instant, and then seemingly melted away at sunrise at sunset. Oh, it went into the shadows, but the brutal massacres who seen from sunrise at sunset, the Prime Minister started to reach a breaking point. He needed a man at the center of it all, the boss, the leader, whatever they call themselves. They needed to be gone, and there was only one man he could trust to properly settle the matter. Three hard knocks scrapped upon the door. He stood up, inviting none other than Maxwell Knight in. The man smiled thinly, nodding his head. Drink, Don Bell asked. The man shook his head. Oh, very well, he said. Still saying, Maxwell, you are here for only one reason, and I'm sure you can understand why. The man shook his head. Everything on the paper you sent that could have been related was redacted from my eyes, I'm afraid, so no, I'm, I'm unaware. Letting out a cough, he started again, Maxwell, these reports are resistance activity. I kept on appearing on my desk, must stop, and there's only one way to make that happen. You and the MI5 have only one objective. Look into the existence of the individual leading them. The boss, he's called. If they do exist, you'll find them and hang them by the neck for the British people to point and laugh at. You hear me? The Director General's face was impassive until the mention of the resistance's supposed leader. Where he began to look much more interested, he stood up. I must admit, Prime Minister, I've been blighted by the existence of this individual as much as you. I swear to you, I will track the boss down, and by the time I'm through with him, the entire nation will know exactly who he is. Dunville sighed, one great sigh of relief, something he hadn't done in at least half a year. Um, also, I have gone over here, and I've spent a lot of political power now. Um, so we've got uh, corporate influence, or ownership in London is about 33%. We're still working on state ownership in the Southeast, which is kind of kind of difficult, actually. Because we click here, of course we don't have enough political power, but there's nothing that gives us more state ownership. If anything, it takes away our ownership after I did emergency takeovers. Um, so I might have screwed the pooch a little bit on this one. So I'm not entirely sure. Then again, I guess we can do this one too. Debt moratorium. It gives AEG more influence per month, which I guess doesn't really matter too much to us. But it does lower corporate ownership by 5%, which is something actually we could probably use. So we're going to do that a few times, but we've got to save our political power. Oh, information strange is in it. All well, the tables have turned. Oh, okay. Yeah. We've got goals. To achieve each goal, the corporations will be your greatest asset and your greatest foe, depending on how you view it. This country is vulnerable to numerous crises. Cool. Cool. 10%. Oh, well, we're going better here. Everywhere else is kind of, eh. But I am very, 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 very interested in how this national stuff is going to work. And I also increase it to 8 as well, so. We'll see, you know. Um, across the channel. <laughs> the memories of, memories of Operation Sea Lion are still alive and well today in the minds of Britons, both young and old. And this is for very good reason. Nazi Germany is the first country in modern history to successfully conquer mainland Britain. It was not since the time of William the Conqueror and the very foundation of our nation. Um, that enemy soldiers had successfully crossed the channel and defeated us, and yet our air force was shot out of the sky, our world renowned navy was sunk, and our scores of troops could not stop the advancing Germans from taking London. Even the political establishment that survived the horrors of invasion, Operation Sea Lion will forever be etched in the psyche of a nation, having destroyed the legend that Britain will never be subjugate, subjugated by foreign power. And of course, the act passes easily. 
Over the course of a single day, Britain saw the most radical transformation of her law and order legislation since the establishment of the German garrison. Something unthinkable in the Parliament of old. But this wasn't the Parliament of old. The outcome had been decided long in advance. MPs from all factions of the BPP said they agreed upon pieces and all eventually voted in favor at the point in time. True opposition voices in both chambers left completely powerless. The entire system was a sham, a farce, a pan pantomime, where the actors played on script and performed their assigned roles night after riot night, all dispute hidden behind the curtain to an audience who no longer bothered to watch the inevitable conclusion of the performance. The corpse of democracy is shambling along at his director's request. But not even the producer of this morbid play let the theater happy. Dumb body every reason to celebrate the closure of another act. All his efforts have been paid off, after all. Finally, the chains of strained Britain's gardens have been broken, and Dumbo could further unleash her defenders upon those who would do her harm, a perfect victory, but something was still off. Donville quite couldn't place it at his mortarcade, sped through the quiet streets of London, and he had given too much away. Had he given too much away to Fontaine and Butler? Had he not been firm enough with the Lords? Had he kowtowed too quickly to Germania? The source of his troubles eluded him. It was only his car swinging, swinging into Downing Street that he saw a knight standing outside, a grim look on his face and a report in his hand that Donville realized what nodded him. It was fear. Fear that this act wasn't enough, that it was just a piece of paper hold at an uncoming hurricane, one that would tear apart all they'd put up with nature's righteous fury, one that thing... One thing was coming from, and coming soon, a storm bruise. Another year of routine. The Second World War left Britain a charred husk of what it was once was. A mighty empire spending a quarter of the globe had been reduced to the Isles alone. Indeed, at least we have Scotland now. The woes of reconstruction, economic failure, internal divisions, and seemingly endless resistance has made the British People's Party's vision of creating a modern fascist Britain a titanic effort. M much more struggle doubtlessly to come, as 1962 dawns. It seems that we are to set for much of the same, however. Perhaps it is light at the end of the tunnel. The passage of the FSA will surely put an end to one of our woes in the resistance, at least. Perhaps this year will be different. Let's hope so. My god, do we need it. But now the party split. As a common saying among many in the government that was trying to work with the BPP is akin to herding cats, the statement is incorrect. A more accurate comparison would be trying to tame a mythical hydra. Years upon years of internal conflict have reached a boiling point. Now, Fountain's ideologues, butlers, pragmatists, and even some of our own in the old guard are practically slavering at the mouths at the idea of tearing each other apart. As each day passes by, it seems more and more in inevitable that one wing of the party will dominate the other. It only means to be seen who will come out on top. As we start to see the cracks in the foundations. Oh boy, you never know what's going to happen. The man who was them. Rodney Sterling checked his watch again. He had arrived at exactly the time specified. Uh, <clears throat> Three o'clock, the sl silver and black bench near the Tower of London and alone. It would only be due to be timely given the man he, he was due to be meeting. However, it had been ten minutes and the man still had not shown up, but just as Sterling was beginning to wonder whether he'd misread the breeze, the man sat down next to him. Wonderful weather, isn't it? He asked the man, knowing full well who it was. Recognizing code words, he responded in the con, I'm not so sure. It looks like rain. Satisfied with the protocol that had been followed, Sterling turned to face none other than the spy master himself. Maxwell Knight, apologies for the white Sterling. You can never be too sure who will get their hands on the reports. I'm sure you understand, Knight said. A polite smile on his face. Sterling rolled his eyes. Knight had always been a make had a way of making others accept his many quirks like this. Hmm. Yes, yes, well I can hardly blame you. The resistance seems to be planning its people here where one least expects it nowadays. Uh Knight raised an eyebrow quizzically. I wouldn't say that. They can't be everywhere at once, Sterling scoffed. It was hard not to be pessimistic over the state of the resistance nowadays, of course. <clears throat> they were growing bolder and bolder, and the government seemed to be doing less to contain them. A moment passed as the silence spoke for him. Knight adjusted himself uh, on the bench and, uh, and turned, looking Sterling's dead in the eye. Sterling, Knight said, laying his, his hand on the man's <coughs> shoulder. We're closer than ever before. I'm giving you my personal guarantee that the resistance are nowhere near as powerful as you believe, and that we will get them understood. Despite his misgivings, Sterling found that the Knight's words had been gone through to him. The resistance would follow eventually. Especially with the Maxwell Knight in the case, he nodded. Interesting. Understood. England's enemies shall have no mercy. And we get 1.14 political power every day, which is not bad, but still. It's not bad, too, over here. I get more naval XP, which is good. So, can we increase this any further? No, we're maxed out, which is fine. Can you imagine if you try to learn TNO? Like, imagine you didn't know what TNO was. And then you try to learn and play it, and you're like, well, heck, what's this economy tab? Social tab you can pretty much ignore. Uh, trade tab. How do you manage that? You know, it's kind of weird thinking about that. Like, oh, what's the economy doing? What's the military doing? What's the social proto uh, protocol for everything here, too? And all the policies that we have. Tender touches. Anne would always miss school in an odd way. Her parents had said that they'd be the best years of her life all the time, and after graduating, she couldn't help but ruminate on those words. There were bits of it that she always detests, of course. She cringed internally, remembering how Mr. Donahue would drone on and on about all the history was a precursor to inevitable German dominance. Were teachers paid more by the government to glorify the past? 
The girl's reverie was interrupted by a pair of arms gently wrapping around her neck. How's the daughter treating you, Miss Newly Graduated? She smirked, turning, turning around her to see no other than Elizabeth. Emma remembered the day they met. It was back in their third year, and she'd been paired up with a pretty blonde girl she'd been too, too shy to talk to. They got chat, and the rest was history. Soft touches exchanged when nobody could see, moments shared between the bike shed in the middle of the night. Had to be a secret. She did not want to be herself, see herself or her love in prison. I was going, to, going splendidly, dear. Yourself, she responded coyly. Elizabeth giggled, and her heart melted. All the better with you, they fell upon Elizabeth's bed holding each other. They talked for what felt like hours, reflecting what adulthood would hold on what the future would hold. You know, I've spoken to old Bill a lot lately. You know, the man at the bar, Emma said. Creating Elizabeth said. Oh, what, whatever for, she asked, looking up. He's not happy with the government, Elizabeth snorted. Who is these days? Emma rolled her eyes. That's what he thinks. And it turns out he's come, he has some of his other friends who also aren't happy with him. Elizabeth's eyes widened. She sat up. You don't mean Emma nodded. The other girl gasped softly. I said that you and I could possibly meet up with them soon. See what it's like. A beat passed. And Elizabeth, Elizabeth nodded. All right, then. Love can always bloom, no matter how forbidden. With cracks in the foundation. Age really had worn down the old Admiral Donville. It had been easy before. Surrendered to the Germans, saved the children of Britain, and now here he was, constantly trying to fix what felt like a leaking ship. He could swear the end was inside, but he could not know how close it was. The people were beginning to accept him. Perhaps history would look back on him as a hero. For now, though, he could only look upon this party. Butler seemed to be more active than ever lately. It felt like he couldn't avoid him as he continued to nudge his way in. An ambitious snake, surely. Don Bill could understand the look in his eyes all too well. He aimed to replace him once he stepped down. It seems not even a decade under the new order could not wipe out the careerism from, his bla from this blasted country. Still, he couldn't deny that Butler did good work. He looked upon, back upon the others. Butler was a naked uh, careerist, but if there was anyone who understood the necessity to strengthen in Britain, it would be Fontaine. The man had always fought for the fascist cause in Spain and here. It, he was one of the first men to join him, but the men he surrounded himself with. He could hear, hear how they talked when his back was turned. They considered him weak, and they could tell, but but he they could never voice their ire towards him, no. They kept it quiet. Side glances, insinuations, occasional muttered comment, ought oh, to be young again. Perhaps he could have trained out things today, however. He could barely stand to watch the silent war playing out in front of him, so he pretended not to notice. Keep calm and carry on, eventually it will resolve itself. Our problems. Assumes that the precious little that the BPP can agree with itself on, both in the Commons and the Lords. There are factions that decry that the return powers granted to the peers fall in the war, while some seek to grant them even more. Some see the German garrison as a threat to national sovereignty, while others wish to work even closer to them. There are even some divisions of the party that question our very commitment to fascism itself. But regardless, we cannot let these issues divide us, so there's one thing that we all wish to see, a strong, stable modern Britain, and that is something that can only be achieved by a strong, stable party. For the sake of the nation, we must pull ourselves together and carry on. The Snake Charmer. Martin Jordan had an easy time in the civil service so far. Uncle Jared got himself a job there, and it was frankly light work. He'd been called into a meeting room alongside three of the other newer staff members. A funny-looking man with a thin white mustache that sat at the head of the table, which itself was occupied by several other older men. Martin recognized the man as none other than Harold Wilson. He nearly frowned upon seeing the man. Many of the family spoke of how he was far too left-wing despite being so high up in the BPP. Wilson smiled at them. Fresh blood, I see. Come in, please. Just please sit. We were just about to start, Martin nodded, assuming that Wilson would be handed the stage over to one other civil servant so that they could chair the meeting. But what happened next shocked him. All right, gentlemen, let's get started. It's been a hard couple of months for everyone here, and it'll only get harder with the workers getting agitated. However, we cannot stand to let Sanders slip and fall behind us. I believe you had a plan, Colin. Martin blinked. Any other civil servants in the room had only just sat down, yet Wilson seemed to have taken the executive decision to chair the meeting. The junior civil servant almost scoffed. The other men in the room were several times a senior. Surely they would soon remind him of his place. Instead, he was shocked as the man Wilson addressed nodded his head respectfully, going into detail. He was in shock. Wilson was, in it, was able to get simply away with this how? Martin's shock only worsened as Wilson asked for a copy of the official report. Something even Martin knew was above the station, and yet another of the men whipped a copy out and gave it to him. The entire meeting, he moved around them like puppets. By the time it ended, Martin was almost cataconic. As Wilson opened the door, and they all followed behind him. They danced with Zoom, it seems. So for this one, we need unemployment. That's a drop. It's going lower, which is good. Inflation. So basically, even if we increase it by 1%, or decrease it by 1%, we still have 3.2%, which is not very good. We might be able to get 4.4% growth. We'll see. Yeah, we can do some of these things again, so we'll see. The autumn of youth. For all we're jolly good fellows. For all we're jolly good fellows. For all we're all jolly good fellows. And so say all of us. And so say all of us. And so say all of us. The raucous collection of youth sang away, stomping around the local pub. Half the regulars had been driven off by his display, while the other half joined in, merely clapping their hands to the tomb. The barman could only look at them with a wary smile. He knew that these lads had just finished school, and they were celebrating like only young men could. One of them stumbled up to the bar, a couple of loose coins in hand. The barman grinned, recognizing the boys. Hey, Ben, how you been handling being a grown-up man now, huh? 
The boy was a slender, dark-haired youth. His cheeks rosy due to the alcohol. He cracked a smile at the old man. Yeah, I'm doing wonderful, mate. Yeah. Had a great time tonight. Got my mates. You know how it is. Another pint, please? The barman chuckled, moving to take another drink. Make another drink for Ben. Do you have any plans for what do you want to do? Maybe work in the factory like your dad? I know he'd be proud of you. Him and your uncle. This comment appeared to give the youth pause. No, I'm not quite sure yet, honestly. He answered, staring, ba staring vacantly. Shaking himself out of it, he paid the barman and went off to rejoin his friends. The barman smiled again. They grew up so fast. And the rising star. A light clink of glasses could be heard amidst quiet, multilingual discussion. An entire half of the Northern London restaurant had been brought, bought out for the night for a soiree, for the cream of the British crop to mingle and mix. The German corporate executives fitted uh, from table to table a collection of dull gray men in expensive suits who were only given the faintest rosy blush of life by the expense of champagne. Amongst these pencil pushers, con men, and swindlers, however, sat a figure who was larger than life. Sitting on a central table right next to Hermann Josef Abs, of all people, was a large stocky man with a slick back hair and a pair of square horned rimmed glasses. That was his original Malding, Rab Butler's right hand man and a rising star of the BPP. He was chatting animatedly to the magnate, his piggish eyes as a focus on the man. So, as I said, Herr Abs, it is a fallacy of the Port Fontaine. Its ideology is entirely based upon anti growth protectionist nonsense, which would frankly be abysmal for business, don't you agree? The other man nodded. I must say, Herr Modeling, uh, Modeling, you do seem very much in favor of Mr. Butler's position and policies, but is he not perhaps rather old? Modeling chuckled, a low, brassy thing, and took another sip of his brandy. Well, we all get old, don't we, everyone? He said to the onlookers, who all politely chuckled alongside him, with a twinkle in his eye, modeling slapped Obbs on the back as if he was an old friend and not one of the most powerful men in Europe. Let's just say that even if Butler is old, well, he's got good taste in friends. I'm sure whoever he picks it will be satisfactory, so to speak. What a charming fellow. A perfectly united, unified party. Butler and Fontaine stood by each other, each flanking the shore of Prime Minister Domville, as he gave another speech about the necessity of unity. How they were the party Britain needed. They a smile placidly, vapidly even, nodding along to the PM. Neither of them could see the other, but they could very well guess that their most gracious ally within the party was sinking. But they could imagine Fontaine, probably gelled his hair too much already, looking more like a helmet than an actual hairpiece, so overeager, as if he would become PM the very moment that the old admiral finally croaked his last bleeding speech about unity. He could imagine all too clearly, even as he saw the comms politely listening to the man. Fontaine. Could see Butler in his mind's eye, that old fat, balding geezer, simply standing there with a glazed look, perfectly content in the assumption that Don Bill would hand over the British People's Party to him simply because he followed the man around like some sort of dog. Britain has no need for dogs, however, they needed a man, a man like Fontaine. Speech ended. They both clapped, of course, perfect uniformity among them, smiled around as the cameras took pictures of yet another successful meeting of the Commons. Yet, yes, truly, what a wonderful unif unified and united party. Butler and Fountain shook hands, a firm grip in both as they looked at each other into the eye. No one noticed anything but a nice firm handshake, but Fountain and Butler could feel the squeeze as they attempted to put their hand over. Fountain would never back down on this, but Butler was not so willing to hand over even the illusion of power to Fountain. The act was for the commons, it was for Domville, it was for the public, but internally. They sharpened their knives, even as they mimicked friendship, for only one can rule. What is this? A party contrast, huh? Jim Gerson. Oh god, how much is here? Peers, pragmatists and ideologues, at the peers, and the Germans' request, the government re first reforms made to the House of Lords that curb their power. Once again, both powers, houses of Westminster are equal, and the peers once again stand as an important pillar for British governance. It is wise for any ambitious leader uh, to carry out the support by enemies necessary. I really should have looked this up before I even started. So, they're doing well in the peers. German corporations. The end of the war saw Britain graciously assisted by the German corporations who now dominate our economy. While they cannot be challenged at the moment, it would be do well if one they kept it to the Germans' good side. Ideologues will gain influence with the German corporations. Currently no factions set to control the party. Hush whispers and contingency plans are afoot. Like English schoolboys. St atop Avalon, the alone man regards this house with envious eyes. Fear and loathing clouds over Earth. Our every move. And so falls the golden child as ashes thrown into the fires of a new tomorrow. Whatever is above will not let the cast go further than this, for now at least. The machine falters as visage waxing and decaying. There will be no going back. Oh, 95%, yeah. Chaos. It represents a general love of chaos in the party due to encroaching and fighting between the factions. Ah, oh, that makes sense. No, if I am. Oh, God. German Garrison, under the command of Rudolf Wolf, the German Garrison guards Britain against those who dare challenge the new order. It would uh, do any Prime Minister well to maintain a positive relationship with the German Garrison unless there be consequences. And the party. 
Since its foundation and formation, the parties have always had a brewing battle between the ideological elements and the pragmatists. Some have even chosen their side, but the parties' ranks and file will simply follow the better man to lead them, whoever proves themselves as that. Particularly influence change. What is this? Ideologies, ideo ideologues will gain 5% influence. But I want to say political power for the economy. Hmm, more chaos. So we don't want too much chaos, I think, right? Well, schnikes. Comrades, the voice fades. <clears throat> Jeffrey Ham sat alone in his office, working for what seemed like hours upon hours on legislation for the new state of Britain. He didn't seem to notice the passage of time the, of the world around him, and he didn't seem to mind it. For him, the only solution lay in the past, in the face of the great martyr of fascism, Oswald Mosley, bless his heart, shot by the cowardly treasonous government as a German's made landfall. Terrible. They thought that his death would snuff out the fire lighted long ago, but to their dismay, the fire grew and engulfed them, purging Britain of its rotten democracy and the Paris that they subsisted on it. Flipping over another page. Jeffrey let his thoughts subside for a moment. It was true. Fashion had finally come to Britain. And it came quicker than he expected, yet he could not live or see the people in charge as anything other than opportunistic hawks unable to do anything but steer his nation to a fruitless path. It was no coincidence to him that the government strayed ever further from Mosley's vision, the more problems there seemed to arise. But hope was not lost, as Ham knew the only way for orthodoxy to be restored, and that was through Andrew Fountain, the charismatic rising ideologue among a party of conservative leftovers and indecisive moderates. Through him, he could finally implement his uncompromised vision. He allowed himself a moment of rest, and looked up at a gaze as at his modest office. Above the door leading to the rest of the building, there was a hanging portrait of Oswald Mosley. Jeffrey allowed himself to drift, looking at the ageless features and the immediate immaculate suit of his martyred leader. In a few moments, he was back in the packed halls where Mosley would give his grand speeches. He remembered how the crowds would roar and hang from his every word, how th through only gesture and tongue he could command the crowd like Neptune commanded the sea. But the halls were empty now, and the voices had long since stopped echoing to him. There was no life before the BUF, and now the party had long been disbanded and left to the annals of history. There was little to do but fight to keep the flame alive so they may one day light up the whole world. Don't worry, old friend. I'll finish what you started. Uh, we want political power, probably. Ooh, production units, though. Ooh, I want the production units. And their interests. And that, uh, in these times of turmoil, it's easy to forget just how much of a positive force Germany has been for the British people. Not only have they liberated us from the shackles of the old world and given us the opportunity to reforge Britain to our image, they aided us in a reconstruction, lifting us to be true equal uh, powers in the pact. No more shall we bogged down by the restraints of democracy and capitalism in the pursuit of fanning the flames for our empire anew. Not only that, our benefactors have also given us the opportunity to be part of the strategic and economic alliance. It's only the least we can do to be able to support them in their efforts, both at home and abroad, and many, in any way possible. With this, we shall prove that we're not a liability, but instead they're finest and loyal ally, pillars of our own. To be the man who rules the UK, one must accrue the support of the many of the key institutions that hold the nation together. There are two of these groups that are most influential in answering the question who governs Britain, the rank and file membership of the British People's Party and the aristocrats and peers who sit within the House of Lords. The party membership. As a wide, widely diverse group, as a BPP, it's the only legal political party is where every up-and-coming bureaucrat, businessman, lawyer, doctor, and aspiring politician throws their lot. Indeed, this tendency of using the party simply to advance one's own career is an issue that the more ideologically minded amongst the leadership finds to be a concerning trend. Nonetheless, as a mass wing party, or mass party, winning the support of the membership requires the use of the old age old tactic that can be deployed against any large group with differing ideals. Something to unify them. Perhaps at the upcoming BPP conference, as an inspiring candidate for future leadership could sway the membership to their side. The other much more difficult group to win the support of is the House of Lords. While mostly aristocratic upper chamber had started to become politically irrelevant at the beginning of the century, the powers returned to them by the Germans through reversing these reforms made them yet again an important force in British politics. If one lacks support of the peers, then it is unlikely that he'll get very far. The support is needed within any government. This means that to win them over, the prospective candidate must attend to their many needs. A house of cards, if there ever was one, and an old companion. The House of Lords is a fickle and often tedious beast for any Prime Minister to handle. While the BPP undoubtedly dominates the upper house, they're still outnumbered by the merciful crossbenchers who have given quite sour as of late, or grown quite sour. Thankfully, the Prime Minister has an old friend perfectly suited to this task. Gerard Wallop, the Earl of Portsmouth, and Domville have been close friends since long before the war, championing the fascist cause in various lobbying groups and societies. Since the war's end and the birth of the new Britain, Lords Portsmouth have been a key member of the Bedford, Chesterton, and now Donville Ministries, and has become to act as a deputy leader of Donville's own, own old guard faction. There's no better man to attend to the delicate task of ensuring the support of the Lords. Yeah, we're finishing these, the terrible twins. 
Since its very birth, the new government has been faced with a seemingly endless onslaught of resistance, but there are few operators in this movement as feared and as well known as the Terrible Twins, Jeff Jones, leader of the United Left Resistance and Fitzroy McLean, leader of the Special Operations Executive, are the two figureheads of the British resistance groups everywhere. The collaborator army and the secret police have desperately tried to hunt down these terrorists time and time again, yet they always manage to somehow elude their grasp despite the entire country knowing their names and faces. Their operations have put a substantial strain on the government. The ability to galvanize support and disrupt operations has been akin to a leech sucking the blood from a host, and yet still. Rumors of a third figure above the twins proliferate, speaking of a man that coordinates the twins' efforts with any hopes of launching another uprising. Regardless of the validity of these claims, the situation will only continue to escalate as King Edward's public man image deteriorates and confidence within the government collapses. It seems to only be a matter of time before open conflicts become reality and German corporate dominance. Oh man, look at the effect from corporate influence. Oh, we invest more money from Deutsche Bank, we get money from them. Oh, effect from ownership too. Get more political power from the state. Uh, from corporate influence, you get more growth. Oh, God. But then you lose uh, daily political power, too. Oh, God. Uh, but, but more state means better monthly unemployment rate. Hmm. Since the Victorian era, the United Kingdom has always held a spark of innovation, and one of the first nations to embrace the Industrial Revolution for what it was. The nation was once a hub of European technological advancement and progress with inventions such as a reflecting telescope and hydraulic press being first introduced on the Isles, or produced on them. However, following the crippling defeat of the Second World War, the British Isles have been reduced to precious little more than a playground for German corporations to run havoc across it as they please. From Volkswagen AG to Reichsbank, they dominate the British market and act with impunity as the government cannot regulate them to protect British, British businesses. The corporations de facto control and own the British economy itself, with the common British labor at their mercy. And then finally, needs must. Emma did not know if her father knew his bar was being used as a meeting place for the members of Himmler or not. She liked to think that if he knew, then they'd be supportive of it. The same way she probably hoped that her parents would be supportive of her and Elizabeth's relationship if they were ever caught. That was an issue for another day, however. Today she just convinced Old Bill that she and Elizabeth had what it took to join the resistance. Old Bill is a spitting image of what one imagines when seeing a grizzled old war veteran. Wrinkled in liver spotted skin, thinning white hair, and a stormy look on his face, the man smoked his pipe sitting across from the couple. A moment of silence passed, so he began after taking a long drag. What makes two lovely ladies such as yourselves want to join up? He said, his voice raspy. Emma cocked an eyebrow. I told you last time we spoke. I hate Don Bill and his all his cronies, and so does my friend here. Bill nodded. Then I should perhaps rephrase. Why, young lady, he said, gesturing a pipe at Elizabeth. Would you want to join? She got up before collecting herself. I want a better future for me and for Emma here. If that means I have to go up to Downing Street and kick Don Bill in the knob myself, then so be it. Emma's eyes widened slightly as Bill laughed. You got a spirit girl? I like that. All right. If you both want in, then who am I to object to? Eh? He extended his hand, and the two girls both shook it in turn. Now, sometimes we meet here, sometimes we meet in the old silk mill uptown. We aren't the only still in Worcestershire, nor even the most important ones, so don't expect to give to Downing Street right away. What you'll be doing is small-scale stuff, enough to disrupt things. Meet me here this time next week so I can show you where to go. Is that clear? The couple nodded dutifully. Bill gave a crinkle smile. Welcome to the resistance, ladies. And with that, we're going to end the first episode of us playing as the re-updated content for the United Kingdom in TNO. Thanks for watching. Oh no, leave a like if you like the video. Subscribe if you're new. Check out my Discord link in the description below. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you tomorrow as we'll see what else we can do before the UK completely implodes. Thanks for watching, and have a great British rest of your day.